So look with me at James chapter 5 and verse 7. And we're still talking about this idea of being patient. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door because Jesus is coming. An example of suffering, as an example, rather, and of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is both compassionate and merciful. And so we started this idea last week, talking about patience and waiting until the coming of the Lord, and we're going to pick back up this week. But as we do, rather than review what we talked about last week, I want to circle back around and, and just kind of identify a topic that we brought up in passing. We hinted at it, but we didn't really drill down on it, and we're going to do that today. And that is the difference between passive waiting and active waiting. Passive waiting is idle and somewhat indifferent to the outcome. Active waiting is a time of preparation. It's not wasted time. It's not lost time. It's actively waiting. And in I know what you're thinking. Maybe this is just a matter of perspective, right? Maybe it just is circumstantial and it doesn't really matter. Uh, maybe it's more practical than that. And I think that's James' point here. I, th- I think if you'll allow me to, seeing that we've already read the text, I think there are, are some differences that we can illustrate here. First, I think it's the difference between waiting at the doctor's office, which would be passive, right, and preparing for company to arrive at your home. You understand the difference? By the way, I mentioned the youth board uh, and, and their preparations for the, the lock-in that we had Friday night. I was, I was thrilled because as, as they made preparations and the, as the time drew near, their excitement began to build because they were ready. They were prepared. They wanted to get the show on the road. And they said as much in the text thread. It was pretty... Uh, encouraging to see, and that's kind of the difference here. School starts in a week, right? School starts in a week. I don't know if you know that or not. How many of you spent some time at the doctor's office last week getting your kids ready with their school physicals? Me too. Actually, I had a good experience. Unusual from the doctor. We got right in. It didn't take very long at all, but when I go, when I take my kids, I get right in. When I go, I have to wait for an awkward amount of time. And when they call and say, it's time for your physical and I schedule an appointment, I typically try to schedule it first thing in the morning because I know if I wait until mid-morning or mid-afternoon, there's gonna be like this backlog, right? And, and, and my appointment might be at noon, but I won't be seen until like 1.30, you know? Which, by the way, begs the question, why am I making an appointment for noon when I won't be seen until 1.30? But that's another sermon for another time. But typically, so I make my appointments first thing in the morning, and I get there at 8, and, and I'm the only one there in the waiting room. And I've already filled out my paperwork online, so my expectation is that I get right in to see the doctor. And so I sit in the waiting room twiddling my thumbs for 15 minutes. And then finally the nurse comes and takes me back, and, you know, we have to go through the whole rigmarole, right? We have to get weighed, and nobody likes that. And we go sit in the room, and... She takes my blood pressure and asks me some preliminary questions, and then I sit in and I wait, and I wait, and I wait. And my appointment was supposed to be at 8, but it's 9 o'clock and 9.15 and 9.30. That's just, it's idle time, isn't it? And it's awkward. I don't like it. There's not much to do. If you have your phone or a book, you can read. You might scroll through social media or check your emails, but it's, it's idle time. Here's what I don't do when I go to the doctor. I don't find myself in the waiting room and I'm not tidying the stacks of Highlights magazines on the, on the tables. I'm not dusting the office. I'm not stocking the, fridge in the, break, the refrigerator in the break room. It's idle time. It's, that's passive waiting. You're waiting for something to happen, and it's passive. By the way, you're not working when you're passive, and I think that's my point. We sit, 
and we wait. But it's different when company comes. It's different. We just had Fonz folks in. We, when we were at the National, they came, and they stayed with our kids and, and came to church here the Sunday we were gone, and I was thankful for them to do that. But the time leading up to that, I can assure you that we were not idle waiting for them to come. No, we were, we were cleaning, and we were trying to, we were looking at empty cupboards, and what I didn't do is shrug my shoulders and say, well, somebody else will take care of that. That's not my job. You know, I walked into the, to, to our, our kid's bathroom, and it looked like a bomb went off in there. Like, how does, how does the mirror get that dirty? Sorry, Ellie. I just, how does the mirror get that dirty? Somebody needs to clean that, and I didn't say, well, somebody else will take care of it. It was not time to take a nap. It wasn't time to go sit down and flip on the television. It wasn't time to go sit down on the couch and open up Facebook or Instagram and start mindlessly scrolling through the feed. No, we went to work. We got ready because we were anticipating guests in our home. And those of you who are hosting small group, you know what that's like because you do it every Wednesday. And, and, and by the way, sometimes you feel like it's easier to start over. So let's just get a match and some gasoline and let's start over because the house is a wreck, right? You, anybody ever feel that way besides me? But you, you're preparing, and that's not idle time. That's active time, but you're waiting for something to happen, and your mindset and your behavior is totally different than it is at the doctor's office. You understand? And that's what James is illustrating here in our text, that, that, that this is the difference between active waiting and passive waiting. And as we wait, as we exercise patience as an outflow of our genuine faith in Jesus Christ for the coming of the Lord, that is supposed to be active waiting. It's not passive. We're not sitting back twiddling our thumbs, taking naps, getting drunk, overeating, partying, living life like there's no tomorrow. We're not supposed to be doing that. We're supposed to be actively making ready. That's the difference here. And Jesus thought, that difference was worth considering too. He told several parables with similar emphasis, talking about the need to be actively waiting for his return. Notably, in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 25, 1 through 13, we have a parable called the parable of the 10 virgins. It's got the chapter heading right there in your Bible. And Maybe you remember the story. I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, but let me just give you a quick synopsis because there's a bridal party. And in Jewish culture, that was a big deal, much bigger deal than it is now. It was like a week-long festival. And in that bridal party, there were 10 maidens. Five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Five of them in preparation for the arrival of the bridegroom had trimmed their lamps and filled them with oil, and five didn't think it mattered very much because he'll get here when he gets here. Five were wise, five were actively waiting, they had made preparations, and five were foolish. Five sat idly by and passively waited for the event to happen. That's Jesus' point. And in our text, as they waited, the bridegroom delayed, Much like Jesus' return, we're all scratching our heads wondering when it's going to happen, and the church has been doing that for centuries now. As the bridegroom delayed, everybody fell asleep. But at midnight, a call came. A cry went out. The bridegroom has arrived. All ten in the bridal party get up, but only five can go with the bridegroom because only five had made preparations The other five, the foolish ones who had waited passively, idly, indifferently, are excluded. And so Jesus says then in verse 13, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And that, my friends, is a warning for us. And it brings us back to what James says in James chapter 5, that we need to make preparations as we wait. Waiting is not idle. It is active. It is not passive but active as an outflow of our faith. By the way, we are going to enjoy one of the metaphors, the many metaphors that Jesus used to, to help us get ready for his return today after the service. And, and that is in communion. We know it as the Lord's Supper. That is, a, that is a symbol, a metaphor 
of active waiting. And by the way, since we're going to do that at the end of the service, if you don't have your cup, they're back there on the tables. You can get up right now and do that if you want. Go ahead. And if you do, grab a handful so that you can give them to people around you, all right? It's, nobody's going to throw anything at you. Just, it's okay. I'm telling you, you can get, you have permission to go get them. But Jesus says something, and even Paul reminds us of something in 1 Corinthians 11 and 26, that as often as we do this, as often as we eat some, some unleavened bread and, and we, we drink some grape juice, some fruit of the vine, as often as we do that, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until what? Until he comes. So, so this is, is an expression of faith as we actively wait for the second coming of Christ, that it is a perpetual reminder through consistent practice, as often as we do it, of our faith, that Jesus not only died and was buried, but that he rose again and has ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he now lives and makes intercession for us, that in that promise, he will come again. And so it's an expression of faith as we wait. By the way, that's the gospel. The gospel does not stop at the cross, and it does not stop at the empty tomb, and it does not stop at the ascension. The gospel is complete when Jesus comes and ushers in his kingdom. That's the gospel. And justifying faith, faith that is genuine and that works, according to James, waits for the fulfillment of that promise. The grace that brings salvation to all people teaches us, trains us, educates us, instructs us, directs us. That while we wait for the arrival of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of our hope, we are to live godly lives. That's Titus 2, 11 through 14, by the way. That the gospel trains us to live holy lives while we wait. That's the gospel. And so let's bring this back around to James. I've, I think I've set this up enough. According to James, waiting for the coming of the Lord is another way that genuine faith is working. And as we continue to drill down on this idea of waiting so that we can understand just how fruitful and how active this time should be, James gives us three personifications of patience. And I want to talk to you about those this morning. Let's look at number one, and that is found in verse seven, and that is the farmer. The farmer teaches us that there are seasons to our lives, and all of those seasons remain under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look back with me at the text. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and late rains. James is talking about seasons. Not just seasons of plowing and planting, but seasons of waiting. Waiting between planting and harvest. And that that season of waiting is under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's talk about this quickly because the, the, the farmer is a familiar metaphor. It's a simple one. Now, we live in, in, in an area where there's still pretty vivid metaphors of this for us when we look around, that there are still farms around us. We can see those. I grew up in, in northern Colorado where there were thousands of acres of corn and thousands of acres of wheat with these intricate sprinkler and irrigation systems. It was fantastic. Combines were guided by GPS. The farmer when it was harvest time, would turn them on and put his feet up on the dash and read a book because that combine was guided by a GPS. He didn't even have to steer the thing. It was fascinating how that all worked. I said all of that to say this. That's not how it worked in James Day. It's not. It's much more uh, rural and agrarian and simple and, and even uh, poor, if I can just say that. That human ingenuity and invention and industry have bypassed many of the obstacles that the farmer that James is speaking about would have had to deal with that would have been such a vivid illustration for his readers. And so let's just take a minute and let's put ourselves in their shoes, can we? That, that this farmer that James is talking about metaphorically would have been poor, not rich, and, and that his farm would have been quite small 
probably the size of the lot your house is built on. Not thousands of acres. Not hundreds, not tens. Maybe an acre, maybe. It's quite possible also that the land he farmed didn't even belong to him. That he would have been a tenant farmer and that, that he was working land that belonged to somebody else and that meant the crops that he was planting and the seeds that he planted in the ground that brought that forth that precious fruit from the earth didn't even really belong to him. That just a portion of it belonged to him. He had to keep some of it for himself to provide for his family and take the rest to market, but the rest belonged to the guy that owned it. Didn't even belong to him. Even still, what he planted would have been precious to him, right? He depended upon it for his living. Like that's how he made money. That's how he provided for his family. That's how he put food on his table. And if the seed that he planted didn't germinate and grow and mature and bring forth fruit, then he had nothing to sell to make money. And he had nothing to eat or to feed his family. You understand? And and I don't don't mean to insult your intelligence, but you know that they didn't have Walmarts back then, right? And I say that tongue-in-cheek. If his crops didn't come in, he couldn't run down to the harps on the corner and pick up some corn. Like that, he he might be able to go to the market, but there's a good chance that if his crops didn't come in because it was a dry season, nobody else's crops came in either, so there was no corn to buy. You understand? And so what James is trying to describe for us is a farmer who is wholly dependent upon something that was outside of his control, that, that they could irrigate and fertilize much like we do, but on a much smaller scale, but he had to depend upon something And someone outside of his control for the precious fruit of the earth. That he had to exercise faith. Trusting God to provide early season rains and late season rains. That that when he planted that seed in the ground after he tilled it and fertilized it. that, That he had to trust that God would send early season rains. Just enough, not too much, to water the earth. So that seed would sprout and begin to grow. And that it would water the earth just enough. So that that seed, once it sprouted, wouldn't immediately dry up and die. That there had to be enough water there for that seed to grow and mature. And then as the season progressed, God had to continue to send rain. By the way, Deuteronomy 11, 13, and 14 describe this situation for us as an expression of faith and love in the Lord our God. Listen to what Moses writes there. If you indeed will love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, he will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. God will provide. If you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, God will provide things like rain. And to the farmer, that meant life or death. You understand? And in the midst of all this, what could he do but wait? That this is, you understand that that this took months, not weeks, not days. There's no drive-through farm. There's no microwave farm. There's no immediate satisfaction to farming. Harvest came at the end of the growing season. And because it's a long seasonal practice, That requires patience alongside of faith. That this farmer had to trust God to provide rains and then he had to wait for the crops to come in. And you know what that means to us as we apply this analogy to our lives? Just like James readers, as they were waiting for the coming of the Lord and we're waiting for the coming of the Lord because that's our context, that that, that, that is an expression of patience through the entire growing season. And if you think about your life in terms of seasons, we have to wait. And that this age, if you will, that we are in, this church age is in itself a season and we are waiting for its completion. We are waiting for the crops to come in, for the last person to confess their faith in Jesus Christ, for for all peoples to hear the gospel and for people in every kindred and people group and language to hear the gospel and be saved. Then Jesus said the end will come. Then the end of the season will come. And so we have to wait. And you know what that means? That means that the Lord of the harvest is sovereign over the harvest. 
Not just for farming, but for people, right? That when Jesus looked out at the crowds and he saw them as helpless and hopeless people without a shepherd, harassed by society and religious culture, beat down and broken, he had compassion on them. Then he turned his attention to the disciples and he said, the harvest is white and ready. Pray, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into the harvest. Right now we're in a season of waiting. That, that, and I don't know what season you're in too because as, this doesn't just apply in a grand scale to the church age. It also applies to your life because there are seasons to your life and to mine. And I don't know what season you're in, but I do know that the season that you're in remains under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that God ordains the seasons of our lives. Ecclesiastes chapter three talks about that. To everything there is a season under heaven. God establishes those seasons and they remain under his authority. So here's my encouragement as we wait. Don't give up. I don't know what season you're in, but don't give up up. Don't grow weary in well-doing and doing good, for you will reap in due season if you don't lose heart. So don't, don't give up. Don't, don't give up. If that's part of what active waiting is. There we make a connection to what we talked about last week between waiting and patience and steadfastness and perseverance. That you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And guess what's going to happen? That you, that you may be in a dry, long, hot summer right now, and you may be miserable in your life, but fall's coming. Amen? And after that, the winter, and we all get a break, and about this time we get tired of the cold, the flowers start to bloom and spring comes. God has ordained the seasons of your lives. You trust him and you walk by faith, and you don't give up because you will reap in due season if you do not give up. And so that's what we learn from the farmer. The farmer teaches us that as we wait for the coming of the Lord, the seasons of our lives remain under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, we look to the prophets. Look back with me at verse 10. The prophets teach us that the future fulfillment of God's promises also remain under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is a marvelous example as an example of suffering, the scripture says in verse 10, and patience. Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We consider them blessed who endured, who remained steadfast, who not only exercised patience, but who did not give up. Now, as we look at the prophets as an example of both patience, they're also an example of suffering because it's worth considering how much they suffered in the cause of their God. Something that I think we read through the Old Testament and we're either so familiar with it that we don't think about it as we're reading it, that we're not putting ourselves in their shoes because those things were written to people in that generation. They were actual people. Or we don't even bother to read it. Think with me about this because they endured much hostility as the mouthpiece for God to rebellious generation after rebellious generation and to idolatrous, unbelieving kings after idolatrous, unbelieving kings. James doesn't go into detail here. He doesn't mention specific prophets by name, but he does tell us that they suffered as they fulfilled their calling. Take the prophets, loved ones, as an example of suffering and patience. So let's just think for a second. Let's just take a quick survey of Israel's history because it's worth our time. If, you, if you're thinking about prophets, then you probably go back to Elijah, right? That, that, that he was the, the quintessential prophet. The, the, the spirit of, of John the Baptist was the spirit of Elijah. Just kind of, a, a, I would consider him to be kind of a rough around the neck bristly, in your face, given his ministry, that, that's kind of what we get, right? That he was in Ahab's ear all the time, confronting him for his wickedness, in Jezebel's ear all the time, confronting her for her idolatry, just in their ear, 
And, and he just was hunted by them his entire career until God translated him and took him to heaven. We think about Isaiah. When you read his writing and you think about all that he did when he prophesied generation after generation after generation, not just to a people group who had turned their back on their God and forgotten their history, but to kings who wanted nothing to do with the God who delivered Israel out of Egypt. Hebrews eleven thirty seven says that and according to church tradition, he was put inside a hollowed out log and sawn in half because he was in the king's face about his idolatry. Jeremiah endured the same kind of opposition throughout his tenure, again, generations long, to rebellious people, so much so that he was called the weeping prophet. Jeremiah didn't yell in people's faces, he cried. That it broke his heart. You think about Ezekiel, prophet during the captivity stage, seven years or 70 years of captivity in Babylon, that he prophesied during that time, would not live to see the return of Israel back to the promised land. And during his time there, he is a walking metaphor, a living example of God's judgment as God tells him to do specific things to teach the people about judgment and mercy. And during that time, his wife dies. Chapter 25, and God tells Ezekiel that he can't even mourn the loss of his wife, that he can't even cry for her because he's a walking metaphor. Daniel, I don't think we consider, we, we, just, we read about Daniel during his time in captivity, but we don't consider how he got there, that, that, that he would have been taken in, in, in one of the several waves of deportation after the siege mound was laid against Jerusalem, which meant that he was kidnapped, taken as a prisoner of war, and, and that best case scenario, he didn't know what happened to his parents. Worst case scenario, he saw them starve to death before the siege wall was broken down and Nebuchadnezzar's armies marched in and laid waste to the starving citizens of Jerusalem. And yet he goes to Babylon and prospers under three different regimes. But don't you think he lived under a cloud his entire life? Fast forward to John the Baptist. I mean, there are so many others to consider, like Hosea, who endured several heartbreaking marriages to the same adulterous woman. I mean, again, a walking metaphor. God told him to do that to teach Israel about grace. John the Baptist was wrongfully arrested. And this is in Jesus' day. This isn't hundreds of years before Jesus comes on the scene. This is in Jesus' day. Wrongfully arrested, imprisoned, beheaded because he pointed out the immorality of the state. You think about that. That he looked at the government of his day and he said, this is wrong. This is sin. It's immoral. And he was arrested, wrongfully imprisoned, and executed because of it. All of them, not just the ones that I mentioned, but all of them suffered without vindication in their lifetime. All of them suffered without justice in their lifetime. There was no justice for them in their lifetime. And so they joined those under the altar, Revelation 6 and 10, that we referenced last week, crying out, how long, O oh Lord, how long before you judge those upon the earth? And they've had to wait all this time and are still waiting and will continue to wait until the purposes of God are fulfilled. Now, here's what that means to you and me, okay? I know that I've spent quite a bit of time here. Here's what that means to you and me. You may not get justice in your lifetime. And I know we want it. Our hearts cry out for it. God has built that sense of righteousness into every human being. It's programmed into the rhythms of our universe. We want justice. But we may, like the prophets, have to wait for it until the purposes of God are fulfilled. That's why we are told 
often in the scriptures, not to take matters into our own hands. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Therefore, if your enemy is thirsty, Romans chapter 12, what do you do? You give him a drink. And if your enemy is hungry, what do you do? You give him something to eat, because in so doing, you heap burning coals of fire upon his head. Jesus told us to pray for those who persecute us and use us spitefully and wound us. Pray for our enemies. It's not this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth kind of justice. We long for that. We want to settle the score. But Jesus said you pray because you have to wait until the purposes of God are fulfilled for justice. I think that's a lesson for us in America when we're so preoccupied with our rights as American citizens. Amen? We have to set some of that aside here, don't we, loved ones, as we wait for the coming of the Lord? So not only are they an example of suffering and waiting for justice, but as we continue to look at their example, it's also worth considering that they spoke about things that they never got to see, that they spoke in the name of the Lord about promises. God was making promises through them that they never got to see fulfilled in their lifetime, that 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 they spoke ahead of time, not just of God's judgment and, and his discipline of his people Israel, but, but there are 308, depending on who is counting, 308 prophecies about the coming of Jesus in the Old Testament. 308. That's just about his first advent. There are countless more concerning his coming kingdom, which we too are waiting for. They're speaking about things that they never got to see. You understand? We're not just talking about judgment here. We're talking about Messiah. They were speaking ahead of time about the coming of Jesus, that that they were revealing grace ahead of time beforehand that they didn't even understand. Grace that would bring salvation, as I said, to all who would believe that they didn't understand. So they were left searching and inquiring diligently as to what it meant. And yet, as Peter writes in 1 Peter 10, or 1, excuse me, 10 and 12, They were not serving themselves in doing that. They weren't even serving their own generation. They were serving us through what they announced by the Holy Spirit. They were talking about things that they never got to see. Interestingly, in that same text, 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12, Peter says that even the angels desire to find out what that means. That they're eagerly looking into that but it's not for them. It's for us. The prophets talked about it hundreds, even thousands of years ago, and they never got to see it in their lifetime. They had to look forward like through a, through a telescope at something far away that God had revealed to them down through the ages and trying to make sense of it all. They never got to see it. God would make promises through them to us that they would never see come to pass And so we read at the end of Hebrews 11, verse 39, that all these prophets that James mentions here, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. That they died in faith and did not receive what God had promised through them. Now, I think that's worth considering because what waiting for them looked a little different that we know because we have the perfect clarity provided by the word of God. And we have the illuminating influence of the Holy Spirit. We know Jesus is coming again. We, We know, even though we might look through a glass darkly, we know what the coming kingdom is gonna look like. We know that justice is coming. We know, we know that God will keep his promises, that it is just a matter of time. But waiting for them looked a little different And it provides a lesson for us now. They desired greatly to see God keep his promises, but the power and the timing to keep those promises, God has kept to himself. You remember in Matthew 24 when the disciples took Jesus out onto the Mount of Olives and they looked across the the valley over at the Temple Mount and they they started pointing out the buildings to Jesus as if he had never seen them, which is just odd to me. 
And, and Jesus says, you see all this? Not one stone's gonna remain on top of another. All, all is gonna be torn down. The Romans will drag this city into the valley and bury it under 10 feet of earth. And, and they, when? When is this gonna happen? T- tell us, tell us when this is gonna happen and what the sign of your kingdom is gonna be. That was their question, an obvious one at that point. We wanna know when this is gonna happen so that we can be prepared. And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. The Father has kept that for himself. That his timing is his own. And his power to keep his promises concerning the coming kingdom are his own. Those things belong to him and they don't belong to anybody else. And guess what? He doesn't share them with anybody else. He didn't even share them with the son during the incarnation. Now, the prophets then, like the farmer, as they made promises in the name of the Lord, guess what they had to do? They had to wait. And and we, as we wait for the fulfillment of those same promises, have to wait. It's not idle waiting. It's not passive waiting. It's not indifferent waiting. It's active waiting. It's faith working itself out. We know. We know Jesus is coming. It's just a matter of time. That it, 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 his coming is at hand. That it's right around the corner. That, that the coming of the kingdom age is right around the corner. It's the next thing that's gonna happen in God's timeline. We know it's coming. But for now, we have to wait. With great anticipation, we're waiting like companies coming. And we're getting ready. Aren't we? We have something to wait for, don't we? Are you with me, church? Amen. Now, let's go back to our text and let's look at verse 11 and talk about our third and final personification of patience here, and that is Job. And Job teaches us that the hope of restoration remains under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is an interesting one, I think, because Job, the the entire book, is one of the most incredible accounts in all of Jewish history. And that as we read about Job, that we, we, we read about him and we hear about his steadfastness. And that reveals something to us. That in, in the story of Job, in the account of Job in the Old Testament, we see the purpose of the Lord fulfilled in compassion and mercy. And I gotta be honest with you. Look at me real quick. If you've read the book of Job lately, I read big portions of it this week. I don't, it doesn't really seem like a story of mercy and compassion to me. Does it to you? When you think about all that he went through, I think three things quickly make his story unique and so incredible. First is the unimaginable pain and unexplained circumstances of his trial. You know that he suffered without answers. He wasn't given any. And I know that if we were to go back to chapter one, that that when we're in the midst of a trial, James counsels us to pray for wisdom, to understand that trial. Job did the same thing. He cried out for wisdom, God. What he wanted to know, why, what was happening to him was happening to him. And even when God does speak at the very end of the book, he never answers his question of why. That he suffered without answers. And in during that trial, he was accused by and attacked by Satan, and on account of which, you know what happened. His children die. He was disfigured with sickness. The life that he had built vanishes in an instant, and so too does his reputation amongst his friends. When they finally show up, the Bible calls them miserable comforters. Because all they can think to do in that circumstance to help Job make sense of it is to try to convict him of some kind of wrongdoing. Surely you've sinned. Surely you're some kind of hypocrite. Surely there's some kind of closeted wrongdoing here. You deserve this, Job. None of this makes sense unless you deserve it. By the way, God roundly, roundly condemns them at the end of the book for that. You spoke for me, but you didn't speak for me. You need to go make a peace offering and Job will pray for you, and I'm going to forgive you, but you did not speak my words to Job in that situation. I think perhaps what was worst of all, in the midst of all of that, for a long time, God was silent. 
And you know how that is, don't you? When pain intensifies and God seems far away, I think that hurts worse, don't you? When heaven is silent and you're praying and you're crying out for wisdom and you're looking for answers and nothing makes sense, maybe, maybe you begin to believe the lies of the enemy. Maybe you begin to believe that you deserve it. That somehow you had it coming. Maybe that was the worst thing of all. And all of that time he suffered without answers. And second, I think his endurance through it all is pretty astounding too. That in the midst of that, imagine the situation with me, if you will. That, that Job is mourning the loss of his children. That all of his livestock have been killed. His children have been killed. His wife has succumbed to the spirit of bitterness. He has bowl, boils from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. And the only thing that he can do to find relief is sit in the ash heap out behind the house where they took the ashes from their fire and dumped them and take a broken piece of glass and lance his own boils. That's what the scripture says. But in all of that, even when his wife comes to him, and you can imagine the scenario, she, you hear the screen door on the back porch slam, and she walks out with her hands on her hips and says, why don't you just curse God and die? Why don't you just give up, Job? Quit holding on to this pretense of righteousness. Job says, you speak like one of the foolish women. In all of this, the scripture says, Job never sinned, he never foolishly blamed God for his misery, that he continued to hope in the midst of all of that pain by saying in chapter 13 and verse 15, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. Right there we have an indication of who he believed in, not what he believed in. You understand? Job didn't believe in the idea of God. He wasn't a deist. Job didn't believe in, in, in some kind of philosophy of life. He didn't trust in his material possessions. He believed God. And he said, God gives and God takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen? And he, he managed somehow in the midst of all of that to endure that he looked forward in faith, not to a better life, not to a time when, when he would be wealthy again, not to, the, not to a time when his family would be reunited again. All of that was gone. He looked forward to a time when his living Redeemer, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would stand upon the earth. I know, he said, my Redeemer lives, and I shall see him stand upon the earth. That's chapter 19, by the way. And in that, he reassured himself. In that, he trusts it. And so his endurance makes that significant. And then thirdly, I think it's something that James calls out here, something that I already admitted that doesn't make sense to me, is that the compassionate and merciful purpose of God can be seen clearly in all of it. And we wonder how. Wonder how, if God never answers his questions, but at the end of the book, God allowed this trial to take place, we realize, because he is good. And because he is good, he is working for our good. And what we have here in James, we have in Romans 8.28, and we have embryonically in the book of Job, chapter 42 and 12, the book of Job says, the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning. That means God is good. That's what that means. Amen? That's not about stuff. If you think that's about stuff, you're wrong. You, you've missed the point. You go down a path to some, some pretty heretical ideas and you'll begin to craft, craft for yourself an idea of Jesus that, that is not biblical, is not the Christ of the Gospels. It's not about stuff. But that means God is good. Because God is good... Through all of that trial, God was working for Job's good. When his children died, God is good and was working for his good. When his wife told him to give up, God is good 
and was working for his good. When all of his livestock were stolen, killed in a storm, God is good and was working for his good. When his friends sat there day after day after day trying to convince him of wrongdoing, God is good. God never wavers in his goodness. And he is always, because he is good, always working for our good. We know that to be true, right? Romans 8, 28 says that, that for those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose, God works all things together for what? For good, for good, because he is good. Amen? And so God blessed the latter days of Job's life more than the beginning. And yes, God restored Job. And yes, God gave him twice as much as he had before. But let me remind you and reiterate, restoration is not limited to material things in this life. Your life is so much more than that. Your life does not consist of the abundance of your possessions. Jesus said that. It's not limited to material things. So here's what that means to you and me. When we look at Job's example and, 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 and the severity of his circumstances and the, the blessing of double portion at the end, please hear me. The good that God intends to do and the kindness that he intends to show you will ultimately be fulfilled when he makes all things new. In other words, you may have to wait for restoration. God could have made Job wait. God didn't have to do that. If, if, if we understand empirically that God is good, we know that, right? And that God is working together all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose, that God did all of that because he is good and because he is working for Job's good. And that if God sovereignly and graciously chose not to restore Job's possessions and not to bless him with more children, he still would have been good. And the outcome in Job's life still would have been good. Amen, church? And we, we don't like that because that offends our modern sensibilities. That somehow seems unjust and unkind to us. Thus my confession just a few moments ago. But here's my point. The fact is, most of us if not all of us, we'll have to wait until God wipes away all the tears from our eyes before sorrows will cease. Before we don't have to battle depression anymore and anxiety and fear and all of those things that keep us up, to, up at night, most of us, if not all of us, may have to wait until God makes all things new and wipes away all tears from our eyes. Listen to me. That's worth waiting for. Amen. We'll have to wait for a time and a place where there will be no more dying and no more pain for us to really enjoy health in our bodies. When mortality, this Flesh corrupted by sin puts on immortality the glory with which Jesus rose from the grave in that eternal body that does not die. Something that would be renewed in his kingdom, made new in his kingdom. There will be no more dying there and no more pain, no more knee aches, no more migraines, no more ulcers, no more cancer. For all of that to be put aside, listen, whatever it is you're suffering from in your body right now, I hope God heals you. I want God's will to be done. I want his kingdom to invade your life right here and right now, but you may have to wait until he makes all things new. My mom did. Still does. Right? Most of us will have to wait 
until we're walking on streets of gold and we hear gates of pearl shut behind us until we don't have to worry about money anymore. And I know you don't have to have a lot to worry about money and you don't have to have a little to worry about money, that all of us find ourselves somewhere on that spectrum and all of us have our own worries and our own anxieties concerning how we're gonna provide for our future, how we're gonna take care of our families, how we're gonna accomplish our goals, how we're gonna pay our bills, that kind of thing, especially now in our present circumstances and economic climate. I want things to get better, I do. I don't wanna see my children suffer what I fear they're gonna suffer in their lifetimes. Just economically speaking, not morally, not spiritually, just economically speaking. I I hope that things turn around and that, but what if they don't? What if in a year's time, gas is $7 a gallon and that there are lines at Walmart just to get milk and bread and eggs? What if in a year's time, half of us have lost our jobs? because some of the big companies around here have closed their doors because things have just tanked, like Great Depression kind of tanked. What if? Now, we can give in to fear, and that's easy to do. That kind of stuff keeps us up at night, doesn't it? But you know what? Here's the deal. Look at me. This is important. It has everything to do with our text. We may have to wait until God makes all things new and we are walking on streets that are paved with gold until we don't have to worry about that anymore. And that's worth, that's worth waiting for. Amen, church? That's what we learn from Job. Then, when God makes all things new, we will have joy to the full and we will be restored to the image of our creator And that gives us good reason to be patient, to wait for the coming of the Lord. It's right around the corner. It's the next thing to happen in God's timeline. The kingdom age is coming. So wait. We have good reason to wait. And so as we exercise our faith this morning in response to what we heard, we're not gonna have a song We're not gonna have invitation, we're gonna have communion. Because every time we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so why don't you take your elements right now if you have them. Let me remind you too, just practically speaking, there's a top layer and a bottom layer. If you open the bottom layer first, you're gonna make a mess, okay? So open the top layer first. As we do this, scripture tells us, and I've already said, Now, I'll say it for the third time because it's important. Every time we eat this little piece of bread and every time we drink this little cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We are exercising our faith as we wait. And so that's how we're gonna respond this morning to what we've heard from the word. We're partaking symbolically of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And we do so in faith. As we wait, we want to do this in a worthy manner, one that is filled with reverence and respect for what we're doing, because it is a solemn time. It's not something that we take lightly or approach irreverently. And so let's do this before we go any further. Let's pray. I'm not even going to pray out loud. I want you to pray with me silently, and let's repent Let's repent of unconfessed sins, knowing that our Lord Jesus Christ is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let's pray together.
It is indeed a solemn thing to remember his death. It is quite another to remember that he's coming again. That encourages us. That is hopeful talk. Isn't it, church? One day we know he will rule. And that, as we sang a few moments ago, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord of all to the glory of God our Father. And so we encourage ourselves now. And as we take these elements and we take this little piece of unleavened bread in our hands, we are reminded of what Jesus said during the Last Supper when he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this, eat this in remembrance of me. So let us eat together and show the Lord's death until he comes. The scripture also tells us that the same night, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, the same night he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. He also took the cup and gave it to them. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. God is making a new promise to you, not in the letter of the law, but the spirit, a covenant of grace ratified in my blood. And so every time that you drink this cup, and you partake of the fruit of the vine. Drink it in remembrance of me. So let us drink together and proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And thus we come back to our text, loved ones. Let us be patient until the coming of the Lord. Because it is a hand. And I'm sure of this, if you allow me to bless you in a different way today. I am sure of this. It is right for me to believe this about you. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, until his son comes again. He will be faithful to complete the work that he has begun in you. So wait. Wait. Be patient, loved ones, until the coming of the Lord. Let us pray together, and when I say amen, you can be dismissed. Father, thank you for the promise of your kingdom. And we know that the timing of your promise and the power to keep that promise is your own. For now, we have to wait, just like the farmer, just like the prophets, just like Job. Help us to wait in faith. And as we do, help us to be active, Lord. Help us to be serving, to go and make disciples. Help us to be loving you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to be loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. Help us to be active, Lord, and to be ready as we anticipate the coming of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Grace and peace in our Lord Jesus Christ.